I'm Donald Davis. Let me welcome you once again to the Sounds of the Mountain Storytelling Festival, coming to you virtually right in your home this year. And as you listen to these stories, which we bring to you by, by video, let's all be looking forward to your chance to come back to Camp Bethel in person again next year. When I was born, I had three cow licks. There was one up here in the front that went way over this way, and then, then I had kind of a double crown in the back that went this way and this way. And so my mother always cut my hair, and she just cut it right down to the bone till there was just nothing left. I'd never had a haircut away from home till the summer when I turned six years old and was getting ready to go to the first grade at school. And all of a sudden, one day, my mother said to my daddy, I think it was on a Saturday, it must have been, because, because he was home all day. She said, Joe, take Donald down to Hazelwood to the barbershop and get him a store-bought haircut to start school with. I probably had been, you know, as long as I ever went with her without haircuts, that I maybe had enough hair to actually cut. And we start out the door, and the last thing my mother said as we went out the door, she said to my daddy, Joe, don't let Jim Caldwell cut it. I only half paid attention to that. I, I didn't know what that meant, but we got in the car, and we drove down to Hazelwood, and we went in the barber shop. Now, all the barbers were Caldwells. There was Herschel, and there was J.R. They were brothers. And then the owner and proprietor of the shop, Mr. Jim, he was their uncle. And they were all lined up, and they had several, you know, patients there waiting for them to get their hair cut. And um, all of a sudden, I realized why my mama said, don't let Jim Caldwell cut his hair. See, there was no, you know, retirement plan for barbers back then. And, and if somebody was a barber, they just kept cutting hair till they fell over, I guess. And, and Mr. Jim, he was really up in the years. Now, back in those days, we didn't know anything about things like, you know, Parkinson's disease or Alzheimer's or, or dementia. All I knew was Mr. Jim had what I'd heard the old people call the palsy. And when he reached out and picked up those shears, here his hand came right through the air, coming over toward the head of that client in the chair. He hit that man's head about three times in passing, going over to the other side. And you know, recently I was remembering that, and I thought, if Mr. Jim were in business today, he'd make a fortune. He could really cut hair the way people want it these days. Well, <clears throat> you know, every time uh, somebody got out of the chair, uh, one of the barbers would say, next, next, next. And finally, all of a sudden, Herschel said next. And he looked at my daddy and said, Joe, I believe it's your boy. And I got up and started up to the barber chair. And then Herschel pulled out this appliance, which is specially designed to make little boys think you're not big enough to be in the barber shop. It was a plank that went across the handles of his big old Coke and barber chair. And I had to sit on the plank and put my feet in the seat, which just said, you're too little to be here. Well, Herschel put this striped kind of sheet around my neck, and he started cutting, and he gave me a haircut. He even turned me around and let me look in the mirror, and he said, well, how's that, young man? And I thought, it's pretty good. And then he put smelly stuff, rubbed smelly stuff around my ears. It was really nice. Well, my daddy paid him. I believe it was 60 cents at that time, and we got in the car, and we went home. As soon as we walked in the door, my mother looked at my daddy and said, Joe, I thought you took him to get his hair cut. My dad said, I did. Can't you smell him? She said, I can smell him, but I don't see that he's had a haircut. She said to my daddy, did you pay for that? My dad said, yes, I paid 60 cents for it. She said, let's go get in the car. And we went out and got in the car, and we started back down into Hazelwood. Now, what I did not know was my mother and Herschel had grown up together, and they had known each other since probably they were not old enough to go to school. And so she had been in charge of him for a long time. Well, we walked into that barber shop, and she said, Herschel Caldwell, I sent this boy down here to get his hair cut, and you have half cut it and charged full price. Now get him back up in that chair and finish cutting his hair. 
And I got back in the chair, and my mother kind of circled Herschel around and around. Cut more on that side. Cut it up there. You missed a hair right over there. There's a little bit sticking up over here. You know, to get those cowlicks killed, you just had to cut it all the way down. And finally, she was satisfied, and we went back home. From that day on, my mother never let my daddy take me to get a haircut again. No, my mother always took me. And we would go to that barbershop, and by now, I was Herschel's special customer. That's what he called me, special customer. And every time, my mother would stand there and tell him how to cut my hair. Now, by the time I learned to read, I figured out that women actually didn't belong in the barbershop to start with. I knew that because there were two signs on the walls that were not designed for a place that women would go into. One of those signs said, no spitting aloud, and the other one said, no profanity. And I thought, if that doesn't mean that women ought to stay out of here, I don't know what it means. But that didn't slow my mama down. All right on up through elementary school, every time she decided I needed a haircut, she took me to see Herschel. Well, when I got out of the sixth grade, I, I, I got moved over to junior high school, you know, junior high school and high school, uh, to, uh, um, um, a half mile or so down the road from the elementary school. But see, the good thing is, my mama was still teaching at Hazelwood Elementary School. So in the mornings, she would go drop me off at school. She'd go on up to Hazelwood. I would be dropped off way early because it was on my mama's way to school. And then in the afternoon when school was out, I had to wait for her to come pick me up. Now, as, as it began to move up into wintertime and got cold, I would have to wait outside. And I would wait on the steps of the band building because that was the west side of the building. It faced toward the sunset, and at least you'd get a little bit of late winter sun waiting for my mama to come. Also, I got this knit, homemade wool knit toboggan. My mama made it for me. It was a good, good warm hat, and it would fit right down over my ears on my head. And what I discovered was, when it got cold, I could get away with wearing that hat almost all the time, even indoors as well as out, which meant I had the ability to cover up my hair, and my mother didn't know how long it was getting. I was actually getting a little bit of hair, and it actually got long enough that I could part it, and it would actually go down, you know, from those cowlicks because it got enough length to be heavy enough to part and go down. I was really proud of it. Oh, man, I'm getting real hair. Well, one day, she came to pick me up at school. I got in the car, and I wasn't even paying attention to what I was doing. But I got in the front seat. My little brother Joe was already in the back seat. And for some reason, I reached up, and I pulled that hat off. And my mother sucked wind. Woo! She said, I thought Donald Davis got in this car. Who are you? I said, Mommy, you know it's me. She said, I couldn't recognize you. Your hair's gotten so long, you look like a sheepdog. How have I let you go so long without getting your hair cut? I thought, because I hid from you. But I didn't say that. She says, I have got to take you to the barber shop, but I cannot do it today because I have got to go get some groceries today. I'll be ashamed to wait till tomorrow, but we'll have to wait. I said, Mama, I got an idea. I am 13 years old. I've been going to the barber shop a good part of my life. I said, a good part of my grown-up life. <laughs> and, and I said, and Herschel's my barber. I know where the barber shop is. I know how to go in there. I know how to wait my turn. Herschel knows how to cut my hair. Why don't you give me the money and let me go to the barber shop why you go to the grocery store. And I will even just walk home from the barbershop when I get through so I won't have to wait for you and you won't have to wait for me no matter what happens. And my mother looked kind of puzzled and finally she says, well, I, get, I, get, I guess that will be okay one time. 
By now, haircuts had gone up to 90 cents. My mother gave me a $1 bill, and she said, now you give this to Herschel and tell him to keep the change. And she let me out at the barbershop, and she drove on up to the AMP store to do the grocery shopping. Well, I went in the barbershop, and lo and behold, that afternoon they were not very busy. And I was really the first one ready to get right up in Herschel's chair. And by now, I'd gotten tall enough that I didn't even have to sit on the plank anymore. I got to sit right in the seat of that coke and chair. It was wonderful. Well, he put the, he put the striped uh, 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 sheet around my neck. I think it was the same one I'd had when I was six years old. And he looked at me and he said, Well, where's your mama? And I looked at him with an insult feeling of disgust, and I said, I am 13 years old. I guess I can come to the barbershop without my mama dragging along. And Herschel said, <laughs> He said, well, big boy, how do you want your hair cut today? And I didn't even have to think. I already had a plan. Now let's step aside just a moment and catch up with something. When you were a little kid, were there some people your mother wished you had never met? The don't you dare play with so-and-so people. Well, at the head of my mother's list was a little boy named Miles Chaffin. Miles lived up the road from us. He lived with his grandparents because both of his parents were military. And Miles, when he was eight years old, he was the first person in our generation we knew who got his own guitar. At eight years old, he thought he was Hank Williams Jr. In elementary school, every time we had a little, you know, a little talent show, a little school show of some kind, here Miles would come to school with his guitar. He'd have a cowboy hat, he'd have on a vest. He'd have on cowboy boots, and when it was his turn, he'd come out on the stage strumming on his guitar, big old grin on his face, and he would look out in the audience, and he would make inappropriate eye contact with some of the mothers. And then he'd start singing, Hey, good looking, what you got cooking? How's about cooking something up with me? Oh, he was an evil boy. Well, when we got to the seventh grade, Miles Chafin got converted. He got converted from Hank Williams to Elvis Presley. And as far as my mother was concerned, that was as low as you could get. He let his hair grow out long. It was swarped up in a big old pompadour hairdo, cut off flat across the back in what they called a duck tail. It was all greasy, and he had even dyed his hair jet black so he looked like Elvis. And he would walk around practicing curling his lip up, you know, and looking mean and winking at everybody along the way. Oh, he was bad. And, and when he was in a little show at school, they would take a card table, put two legs down, stand that card table up in front of him so you couldn't see him wiggling around up there while he was acting like Elvis. So now you understand the plan. When Herschel said to me, how do you want your hair cut, big boy? I said, do you know Miles Chafin? And Hurl said, and, and he said, he, he, he. I said, I'd like it cut like, like Miles Chafin. Now, I don't want it dyed black, but I'd like it cut like that, especially up high and especially in the back. And he says, I believe I can take care of it. Well, I'm not sure that he cut any off except to shave it straight off like a duck tail in the back. He might have actually picked some more hair up off of the floor and tried to stick it on there. But he started putting wax on it. Wax, wax, wax on it. And when he got it all waxed up, he got this silver metal comb. And he got a Zippo lighter. And he heated that comb up with a Zippo lighter. And then he started pulling that hot comb through that wax in my hair. He pulled it way up and he let it flop back. And he pulled it up and he flopped back. And he pulled it up. And, it, and you could see little, you know, little marks through it from the comb. Just like little, you know, little rows in a field that had been plowed. Oh, it was looking better all the time. 
And finally he said, I believe we've got it. You want to see? I said, no, I don't want to see. I know you knew what you were doing. I said, how much do I owe you? And Herschel said, he, he, he. It's on the house. And I kept the dollar bill in my pocket and started walking home. Now, I knew Waynesville was a friendly town, but I didn't realize how friendly it was till I was walking home that day because every time I met a car, people would slow down, they'd blow the horn and wave, they'd roll the window down, stick their head out and holler and wave. And I got all the way home before finally I looked in the mirror. And my first thought was, like George W. used to say, mistakes were made. It scared me to death to see what I looked like. I thought, I'm going to die before this day is over. What am I going to do before my mama gets home? Well, I knew she was at the grocery store. She just didn't have anything planned for supper. And I thought, here's what I'll do. This will rescue everything. I will fix supper before she gets home. And that way, she will be so tickled that she doesn't have to cook, she won't even notice my hair. So I got up in the freezer part of the refrigerator. I got up out a package of hamburger frozen because, you know, you could put it frozen right in the pan and start cooking it while you whack it off of there as it melts and melts and cooks at the same time. I got out some green peas out of that same freezer. I got some green beans. I thought, we'll have green peas and green beans. That was a good combination to have along with our fried up hamburger for supper. And I was just cooking away when my mama came in the door and she screamed. See, she thought somebody had broken into our house and had not only stolen food, but had actually dared stay behind to cook it. And then I turned around. Well, the world changed at that moment. I did not die. Because you see, in that moment, blessedly, my mother was not mad at me. No, she was mad at her old friend, Herschel. She said, Herschel Caldwell ought to know that Lucille Davis would not even have a child that looks like you. He ought to know that Lucille Davis is ashamed of anybody that looks like you and would not have it. Go get in the car. And I got in the car, and I knew we were going back to the barber shop. We drove back into town, and you know what? The barber shop was closed. And we got in the car again, and my mother took off, and I thought we were going home, but we weren't going toward home. And then all of a sudden, I, I didn't know where we were going because, see, I didn't know where Herschel lived. But we went straight to Herschel's house. We didn't park in the front and knock on the door like polite guests. No, we drove right down the driveway. My mama got me out of that car, and we marched through the kitchen door without even knocking on the door. Herschel and his wife were sitting there at the table eating supper, and my mother pointed to him and just pointed to me and said, Fix it! And he knew what he had to do. His wife was standing over against the wall just trembling while she watched. Herschel got my head in the kitchen sink. He used, I think, two bottles of green grease-cutting detergent, getting that wax out, and emptied a 60-gallon hot water tank. But finally I was degreased, and he got up in the top of a closet and got down some implements. And with my mother giving him directions, he cut my hair off to the bone. And then my mother looked at Herschel and said, Herschel, give Donald his money back. And without a moment of pause, he pulled out his billfold, opened it up, and gave me what he and I knew was another dollar. After that time, my mother never had to go with me again to the barber shop. She would just say, it's about time to get your hair cut. Take this dollar. Herschel knows what to do. And I'd take my dollar and I'd go to the barber shop and I'd go in. Herschel never would ask a question. He would just look at me and go, hee, hee, hee. And he'd cut my hair down to the bone and he never charged me again. 
I would say, don't I owe you something? He'd say, oh, no, no, because every time I get to do this, I get to remember that look on Lucille's face all over again. That's worth a dollar any day. The last time I saw Herschel, it was the year my daddy died. And I went to visit dad in the, in the nursing home. He was there for the last six months of his life. And while we were visiting, Herschel came in. He was now retired. The barbershop was closed, but he was traveling around visiting his older clients and cutting their hair wherever they happened to live. He cut daddy's hair and they visited and we visited and we talked. We just had a wonderful time. It was a great time. And finally, Herschel got ready to go and all of a sudden, my daddy said, wait a minute, Herschel, I didn't pay you. Herschel said, uh, Donald paid me. My dad looked at me and said, I didn't see you give him any money. Herschel said, he didn't even give me any money. He paid me by being here. You see, when I saw him, after all these years, it brought back that look on Lucille's face. And that look is something you cannot pay for. Well, we hope you're enjoying the story so far, but don't forget, leave a generous donation to Camp Bethel and to the tellers for their tips. We hope the festival will be back home in person next year and need your help in getting the camp ready to reopen as soon as possible for summer camps, guest groups, and special events like the festival. Please click on the link below and make your contribution toward the work, the fun, and the fellowship that find a home at Camp Bethel. Thanks for watching and thank you for your gift.